Thank you for tuning in to the Mount Sinai Missionary Baptist Church of Memphis Incorporated, our YouTube channel, our Bible study for June 4th, 2020. Uh, we're continuing to study about what defiles a man as Jesus taught his disciples in the book of Mark, chapter 7, verse 14 through 23. But before we jump into that, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we pray that you would help us to stand strong against Satan's accusations as to our relationship with you. Help us to know that if he questioned Jesus' relationship, he will certainly question ours. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, uh, Mark uh, chapter 7, and I'm not going to read uh, all of the verses again this week. We read them for four or five weeks at least now. Uh, so we're just going to read the last three or four, last four verses of Mark uh, chapter 7, verse 20 through 23. That reads, and he said, what comes out of a person is what defiles him. For from within, out of the heart of man, comes evil thoughts, sexuality, immorality, theft, murder, adultery, coveting, wickedness, deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, and foolishness. All of these things come from within, and they defile a person. Now, our focus for this week's lesson will be centered on uh, Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 through 11. Verses 1 through 11, and I'm reading from the English Standard Version. Uh, and we find Matthew chapter 4, verse 1 says, Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And after fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. And the tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But he answered, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and set him on the pinnacle of the temple. And he said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, uh, He will command his angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. And Jesus said to him, Again it is written, You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. And again the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, all these I will give you if you fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, Be gone, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. Then the devil left him, and behold, angels came and ministered to him. We are continuing our study on slander which is used synonymously in the Bible with the word blasphemy. Blasphemy and slander comes from the Greek word blasphemia. In the Greek, it means to slander or a detraction or to take away from a person's good name. It is speech that is injurious to another person's good name, and also it is reproachful speech and that is injurious to divine majesty. In other words, it's reproachful speech that is injurious to God or Jesus Christ. Now we're looking at the originator of slander, of blasphemy, or lies, and it comes from Satan. Last week we focused on how Satan accused Job of serving God for what God was giving him. That accusation of Satan often makes, it's the accusation that Satan often makes against us. He questioned whether we are serving God because of what God is blessing us with. Now this week we are focusing on Satan uh, as he introduces the if factor 
against Jesus that God had previously stated now that Jesus was his beloved son in whom he was well pleased. Now, it appears that Satan is not bothered by what we say, but what the Lord says. That's a good reason for us when we preach, teach, or witness that we become comfortable with saying and believing uh, and, and, and what we have been told by the Holy Spirit or Jesus or what comes from God through his word. And, and, and in our struggles, we tend to prefer opinions, people. We tend to prefer opinions over what thus saith the Lord, especially in our predicaments of trials and tribulation. We must be careful that we don't turn a word deaf ear to the word of God and fail to heed the warnings that is found in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 3 and 4. For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passion and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. And we are living most definitely in times like those right now. For we find that people are, are, are bunching up around people that have uh, touchy feely sermons that, that tell them how good they are, that tell them that they can, uh, if they will have the kind of faith that they can have whatever they want. The, the uh, what do we call it? Uh, the name it and claim it uh, type of ministries. What God says is our tool to rightly divide and the, the word of truth and to live by and to deal with what Satan has to say about our relationship with God. The first thing to note in our lesson tonight is that God had already spoken concerning the bond between him and his son, Jesus. Matthews 3 and 17 says, And behold, a voice from heaven said, This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. From the high and holy experience of blessings at the Jordan River, Jesus was led into the wilderness for testing. Jesus was not tempted so that the father could learn uh, uh, anything about his son, for the father already had given Jesus his divine approval. Jesus was tempted so that every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth might know that Jesus Christ is the son of God and the conqueror. He exposed Satan and his tactics and he defeated Satan because his victory, because of the victory of Jesus, we can have victory over the tempter just as the first Adam met Satan in defeat. So the last Adam, Jesus Christ, met the enemy in victory. Adam met Satan in a, in a beautiful garden, but Jesus met him in a terrible wilderness. Adam had everything he needed, but Jesus was hungry after 40 days of fasting. Adam lost the battle and plunged humanity into sin and death. But Jesus won the battle and went on to defeat Satan in more battles, including his final victory on the cross. Our Lord experienced of temptation prepared him for to be our sympathetic high priest. Hebrews 4 and 14 says, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who is very re respectful and, ha and has even been, it been tempted as we are, yet without sin. 
And verse 16 says, so let us with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace in times of need. It's important to note that Jesus faced the enemy as a man, not as the son of God. That does not mean that Jesus quit being as much God as God is in order to become as much man as we are. We as believers who have received the spirit of God must become accustomed to allowing the same spirit to not only live in us, but to live through us as Jesus did. Jesus' first words were, man shall not live by bread alone. We must not think that Jesus was used his divine power to overcome the enemy because that is just what the enemy wanted Jesus to do. Jesus used the spiritual resources that are available to us today even. The power of the Holy Spirit, remember in, uh, uh, that, that uh, Jesus was led of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of him. And he also led Jesus in using the word of God when Jesus kept saying, it is written. Temptation involves the will, and Jesus came to do the Father's will as indicated in the book of Hebrews chapter 10, verses 1 through 9. Now let's walk through these uh, temptations that Satan presented Jesus with. The first temptation this involved the love of God and the will of God. He says, since you are God's beloved son, why don't your father feed you? Why does he put you into this terrible wilderness? This temptation sounded like Satan's word to Eve in Genesis chapter 3. It was subtle, a subtle, a tricky suggestion that our father does not love us. But there was another suggestion. Use your divine power to meet your own needs. Here is a good place for me, with me to remind us that meekness as Jesus displayed it is not power, uh, or not weakness rather, but it's power under control. Again, meekness is not weakness as many suppose, but it is power under control. When we put our physical needs ahead of our spiritual needs, we sin. When we allow circumstances to dictate our actions instead of following God's word and his will, we sin. Jesus could have turned the stone into bread, but he would have been exercising his power independently of the Father's will. And he did say that he came to obey the Father's will in John 5 and 30 and John 6 and 38. Jesus quoted Deuteronomy 8 and 3 to defeat Satan. He says, Feeding on or obeying God's word is more important than consuming physical food. In fact, it is our food, according to John chapter 4, verse 34. It says, Jesus said to them, my food is to do the will of him that sent me and to accomplish his works. Now, the second temptation found in verses 5 through 7 of our lesson or our text for tonight. The second temptation was even more subtle. This time, Satan also used the word of God. So you intend to live by the scripture, he implied. Then let me quote you a verse of scripture to see if you will obey it. Satan took the Lord Jesus to the pinnacle of the temple probably about 500 feet above the Kidron Valley, 
And Satan then quoted Psalms 91, verse 10 and 11, where God promised to care for his own. If you really believe the scripture, then jump, Satan says. Let's see if the Father cares for you. Now note carefully our Lord Jesus reply. Again, he says, it is written. We must never divorce one part of the scripture from, from another part, but we must always compare spiritual things with spiritual things, as we are taught in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 13. We can prove almost anything by the Bible if we isolate texts from the context and turn them into pretext. And far too often, that's what's being done in the pulpit to the vestibule. Satan had cleverly omitted the phrase, in all thy ways, when he quoted Psalms 91. When the child of God is in the will of God, the Father will protect us. We tempt God when we put ourselves into circumstances that forces God to work miracles on our behalf. And even when we find ourselves in self-inflicted predicaments and situations or circumstances, and we imply or think that God has to stamp his approval to what we decided. We tempt God when we try to force him to contradict his own word. It's important for us as believers to read all scripture and to study all God has to say. For all of God's words, 2 Timothy uh, chapter 3, verse 6 and 7 says, are profitable for daily life. Now let's go to the third temptation found in verse 8 through 11. The devil offered Jesus a shortcut to his kingdom. Jesus knew that he would suffer and die before he entered into his glory, as indicated in Luke chapter 24, verse 26, and 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 11, and 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 1. If he bowed down and worshiped Satan just once, this is the force of the Greek word that says, he could enjoy all the glory without enduring the suffering. And Satan oft time tries to tempt us to take the shortcut. Satan has always wanted our worship because Satan has always wanted to be God. As indicated in Isaiah chapter 14, verse 12 through 14, worshiping the creature, instead of the creator, is the lie that rules our world today, as indicated in Romans chapter 1, verse 24 and 25. There are no shortcuts to the will of God. And if we want to share in the glory, we must be willing to share in the suffering. Satan is quick to offer what is not his to deliver, but God delivers all that he promises. Psalms 24 and 1 remind us that the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein. And Jesus replied with Deuteronomy 6 and 13, thou shalt worship the Lord thy God and him only shall thou serve. Satan had said nothing about service, but Jesus knew that whatever we worship, we will serve it. Worship and service must go together. Satan sneaks away now, a defeated adversary, 
but he did not cease to tempt Jesus. We could translate Luke chapter 4 verse 13 at, that says, and when the devil had ended every possible kind of temptation, those three temptations that we've studied, then he took off from him until a suitable season. Through Peter, Satan again tempted Jesus to abandon the cross in Matthew 16 chapter uh, verses 21 through 23. And then in John chapter 6, verse 15, he, uh, he was, Jesus was tempted through the crowd that had been fed by Jesus. When Satan implied that Jesus take the easy route to the kingdom. One victory never guarantees freedom from further temptation. But one victory the songwriter says, will help us some other to win. If anything, each victory that we experience only makes Satan angry and he tries harder to tempt us. After Jesus had defeated Satan, he was ready to begin his ministry. And no man or woman has a right to call others to obey who has not obeyed themselves. Our Lord proved himself to be the perfect king whose sovereignty is worthy of our respect and our obedience. God sent the perfect savior, his son who died for imperfect sinners on an old rugged cross one Friday on a hill called Calvary. For us, he hung, bled, and he died. Yes, he did. They buried him, but early the third day morning, he rose, hallelujah, from the dead with all power in his hand. Power to lift up bowed down heads. Power to mend broken hearts and to set free those that are held captive by the penalty of sin. And I'm glad today that when Satan tempts me and I'm not able to resist him fully myself, that I can rely on the word of God and repeat as Jesus did, follow his example and continually say it is written. Before you can say it is written, you got to know what is written. Jesus has given us the formula to defeat Satan when he makes accusations as it pertains to our relationship with God. God is our heavenly father and we are his children. And that is not debatable because that is scripture. That's all I've got for tonight. I pray that uh, we will become stronger as Satan seeks to attempt us. Let us pray. Lord, help us to always trust the salvific work of Jesus to keep our relationship with you and other believers intact. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So from here, we go on up the King's Highway, marching up to glory. And along the way, we'll see you hopefully next week for another Bible study. Thank you again for joining us. I do realize that you had many options today, but you chose to spend some time listening to little old me share the word of God, dealing with slander. Take care, I love you, God loves you, and we'll see you the next time.